Hello, everyone. My name is Mike Milliard. I'm executive editor of Healthcare IT News, and welcome to Hims TV. I'm here today with Dr. Jacob Ryder, who's the CEO of the Alliance for Better Health. Welcome, Jacob. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Mike. Happy to be here. You know, Healthcare IT News has written about you and you guys for you know a while now, a couple of years. Um, but for those who may not have uh, know, you know, talk about yourself uh, and uh, your bona fides and, and and about the Alliance for Better Health and, and what you do. Myself is easy. I'm a simple family doctor. Uh, have been working in upstate New York all of my career. Aside from a little stint uh, of uh, federal service when I was the deputy national coordinator in the office of the national coordinator for health IT. Mm -hmm. um, and I was CMIO at Allscripts before that. So um, worked here in hospitals and as a, as a full spectrum primary care doctor for a number of years, uh, then went to Allscripts in industry and then went to the regulator of that industry. Um, and then for the last four years have been doing uh, for lack of a better term, public health work with Alliance for Better Health. And I think I kind of caught the public health focus from my colleagues at HHS um, and thinking about how information technology um, enables us to do things at scale that really we couldn't before we had information technology tools that could help us simplify, automate, um, you know, make make more efficient the things that we would optimally do. So I guess that is the segue into Alliance for Better Health and what are we and, and what do we seek to be. We were created by the DISRIP program and folks in New York will know, but most others won't. So I'll explain a little bit about what that was or is. DISRIP stands for Delivery System Reform Incentive Payment Program. Um, it was a five-year initiative in New York. A number of other states have, have had DISRIP programs. The program in New York ended about a year ago, um, and the goal of the program was slash is because, of course, you know, even though the program explicitly ended, our our ambition to do what we intended to do does not end, and that's kind of the point. So our ambition is the the ambition of the project is to reduce preventable acute care utilization um, in the Medicaid population. So people who have Medicaid and or the uninsured often use acute care facilities more than they should. And of course, there are judgments about what should or shouldn't be use of an acute care facility. Um, but if we can keep people healthy, then we can keep them out of the emergency department and you know, by extension, the hospital. And so it, over the evolution of our organization, we've focused a lot on keeping people healthy, right? So this isn't just about putting a stop sign up at the ED and saying, you know, don't, don't come in. Because, mm -hmm. um, of course, if you know, saving money was the purpose, the primary purpose, maybe that would be the approach. But improving the health of the people that we serve is the primary goal. Saving money is the secondary goal. And of course, you know, as they say, no margin, no mission. So that is part of why New York and the federal government made these investments to create organizations like ours, is to save money, right? But we save money by improving health. And so as we focused on improving health, um, we've, uh, we've done what some people refer to as going upstream. We've gone upstream. And so we think of health care as the sum of three parts of care, social care, behavioral health care, and medical care. And so if we think of health care as all three, rather than just the third, right? Mm -hmm. You know, my mom says, my son, the doctor, she thinks healthcare. What she's saying is medical care. And so we're expanding the scope. Um, and I'll, you know, reference another family member. My, my daughter, the social worker, makes fun of me, right? Because she's like, you know, I roll, dad discovered social work, right? Dad's discovered what social workers do, which is social and behavioral health. And that these are more important sometimes than medical. Because if you think about what those of us with MD after our name were trained to do, we were trained to react, right? To respond, to treat disease. Um, and that makes sense, but it's not always what's best for the population. And so what Alliance for Better Health is now doing is we are working with community-based organizations to establish contracts with at-risk care delivery organizations, or, and that would be a value-based payment activity, or health plans because both of these can recognize now that if the people are healthier, well, then they need less care, right? So it's health over care. 
Um, and we can keep people out of acute care. We can keep people out of even the doctor's office if we keep them healthy. We, we find ourselves over the past seven months or so in uh, an era where public health and population health are really obviously at the forefront. Um, when I spoke to you in April, I think one of the projects you guys were doing was, was getting uh, Bluetooth uh, enabled uh, kinsa thermometers out to people to kind of track you know, how COVID was spreading in the community and, and get them to the people who, who, who might need them. What are some other projects you've been doing um, you know, on that front during the pandemic uh, since we last spoke? I think probably the most significant work we've done over the summer has been working with area food pantries. Um, because food assistance has been something that's been front and center in the context of you know, unemployment and folks simply not having the cash mm -hmm. to keep food in their, in their cupboards. And so we've been working a lot with food pantries and the Capital District Food Bank, which is the you know, entity that helps to supply many of the food bank pantries, um, to make food available. And you know, as I said earlier, to connect those who have food insecurity um, with the resources that can help them, not just now, but on an ongoing basis. And, and so that's part of the challenge is this is not an event, right? right? This is a process. And so we need to also understand what kind of infrastructure needs to be in place for a very long time, because as, as you mentioned, right, this is not over. Uh, you know, COVID has exacerbated existing um, uh, imbalances of resources in our communities and we know that people of color are you know uh, have have been affected much more um, than other parts of our communities and so we've also participated in you know a number of initiatives where we're trying to raise awareness of health disparities and health inequities um, in our communities so we're participating with lots of lots of organizations that are you know trying to raise awareness and and sensitivity to um, the needs of the, the people in our communities who are underserved. You mentioned health IT, obviously, which is crucial to this as well. And, you know, sooner or later, that kind of social care and the clinical care have to intersect. And one of the challenges I know we've talked about with decision support is, is data and, and, and getting this data into, you know, actionable, usable formats and a consistent format, which is a challenge on any normal day in healthcare, of course, anyway. But, um, you know, we've seen interesting projects on that front. We just saw this week that Epic and Lyft are partnering to, for transportation issues and, and Uber and Cerner have done the same thing. So there's stuff like that going on. But um, there was an interesting article from the UCSF research, researchers recently talking about this new field that they see emerging of social informatics, which is gonna kind of focus on you know data and, and, and technology and how they, they can help us. You know, how do you see that continuing to unfold in the years ahead? It's an imperative evolution of what's happening, right? So we see initiatives like the Gravity Project, um, which has really started to build momentum um, toward the standardization of a set of terms with which we can describe um, the, the, the needs that people have, right? Mm -hmm. We don't, we, it's not yet complete, just like you know, many standards and vocabulary projects, it not, not yet complete, but it's an important starting point because until we can convey um, both needs and services in a standardized form, right? So it's like, uh, you know, if I order a, oh, I don't know, a COVID-19 test, right? There's actually a code I can use to order a COVID-19 test and I can specify whether I want a rapid or a PCR because there are different CPT codes for these tests. If I were to order a COVID-19 vaccine, when it becomes available, there will be standardized codes that I could use to, to do that, just like I can order penicillin or a CBC. And so how can I explicitly identify food insecurity or housing needs? Um, and then how can I um, convey in a standardized form that uh, the need has been addressed or has not been addressed. And I mentioned Unitas, which is one of several of these platforms. And I wanna make sure that, you know, even though our organization selected this one and you know, we work well with the company, um, that's not the only company. And we've been working with other companies like Unitas, such as NowPow and Bertha. Um, and as you probably know, with the, the HIMSS uh, SDOH task force with which I chair and somebody from NowPow, uh, uh, Catherine, uh, co-chairs. Um, so, you know, we as an industry are working together much mm -hmm. in the same way that I worked with my counterparts from 
Epic and NextGen and eClinical Works and Cerner when I was, you know, sort of on the industry side of health IT. So I think what we're seeing in the, the social space, in the sort of social inter informatics space is very much like what we experienced in the clinical informatics space you know, a decade ago. Um, and so for me, it's thrilling to sort of learn from what we did well before, which was collaborate together toward public, you know, public good and truly shared value. Um, and also understand that there will always be competitive forces and that there are companies that are going to compete in the marketplace. Um, but let's pick the places where they should compete and where they shouldn't, right? And right. so interoperability, for example, is a space where what I'm hearing from these companies, and of course I'm nudging them in this direction, mm -hmm. um, is interoperability should not be a space where they compete, right? So let's collaborate towards shared vocabularies, shared resources, resource directories, right? So I should at some point be able to initiate a referral for a service in one of these systems and have it satisfied in a different system and have the message that that service was satisfied come back into the originating system. So before I let you go, you know, what's next on the, on the agenda? I mean, I think you guys have a conference coming up. Is that, is that true? Yeah. So we have a conference that we're calling Converge that, you know, I'm happy to share with the, the details with you and your, your readers. Our keynote speaker um, is a, a character, I'll say that, you know, fondly, mm -hmm. uh, named Len Nichols, who I've known for a number of years, um, and who has coined the, the phrase uh, trusted broker as the role of an organization like ours to sit between community-based organizations that focus on public good and at-risk care delivery organizations or health plans that focus on, you know, essentially um, paying for health care. And so Len's written a number of papers, most recently about a year ago in, in health affairs with his colleague, Lauren Taylor, um, looking at sort of what are the economic principles behind this model and why it simply makes sense for communities to share these investments. And so one of the things that, you know, we often argue is that none of the work that our organization does can be done by any single entity. So in, you know, in a given metropolitan area, there might be one or two health systems and two or three dominant payers. And we've seen a number of well-intentioned siloed efforts at addressing social determinants of health. So a given health plan will make investments in, you know, either assisting with food or with housing or with transportation. Um, and yet they only address part of the part of the, the, the people that are served in a community. And then based on, you know, whether you came out of such and such a hospital when you were discharged from your last admission, or whether you have a certain color, you know, insurance card, you either get or don't get certain services. This makes no sense to us. Um, and what it does, it actually divides the community. You know, health plans have mastered how to work with physician practices and hospitals. And they speak a language with each other that no human would understand. Well, encourage people to attend. I think we'll have some information here on the screen. Um, but thank you so much for being here, Jacob. It was really great to talk to you, as always. My pleasure. You too, Mike.